Good evening. So I'm Brett Finlay. I'm a professor of microbiology and biochemistry at the University of British Columbia. I'm also co-director of a seed pro program on humans and microbes. And I've studied diarrhea all my life, so I love feces, so this talk is restricted for fecal... <laughs> So, microbes. Antti van Leeuwenhoek discovered him over 300 years ago when he built the first microscope. And one of the things he did is he swabbed out his mouth, held it up to the light, and saw all these animacules. And he made this most stunning statement that there's more microbes in his mouth than people living in the Netherlands, which is where he lived. Microbiology was born. What do we do with that information? Nothing. So, basically, we knew they were there, we didn't know what they do. So I want to continue Vlad's thought experiment where he makes you look around the room. Look around the room, what do you see? A bunch of people, right? Wrong. I see a bunch of homo sapiens. They're just coated in microbes. <laughs> There's more microbes in and on you than there are human cells in and on you. They contain 100 times more genetic material than you have the homo sapiens DNA in, in you. So I love to tell my students, you're more microbe than human. That really pisses them off. We know this because we've been able to start to sequence of things. So let's go back a bit more to what do these things do. So the last decade has just seen a profound explosion in the realization these microbes actually do something for us. We now realize that they affect how the brain develops, how the gut develops, how the immune system develops. Most of the food you eat, you can't digest. You leave it up to your microbes because they're in your gut anyway. They produce essential vitamins. You cannot live without these things. So we call this, we now realize we're what we call a holobiont or a symbiont kind of thing of this collection of microbes and us. And this really drives philosophers nuts when I'll say, what is it to be human? And so we ask this, this, and I say, what about all those microbes living on you? Are they part of you? And their brain just goes, and then we change the subject. <laughs> so going back to history again, about 125 years ago, two very famous microbiologists, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, basically showed that microbes cause disease, the germs. And this is a huge step forward because they didn't know what was causing plague and cholera and things. Then Pasteur took it a step further. He boiled these things, he cooked them, he pasteurized them. And then if you kill them, you don't get disease. So if microbes cause disease and killing prevents disease, what do we do? We kill microbes. And that's what we did. We got antibiotics, vaccines, sanitation, we cleaned up the sewers and everything. Yay! In the last 50 years, infectious diseases have really gone down in our society. They're not the problem they were. Great. But look at the right-hand side of this curve. That's the diseases of today's society, obesity, asthma, IBD, all these other diseases we see that we currently face. And it turns out that in our quest to get all these bad microbes, we also got rid of the good ones. And ironically, all those diseases on the right are now being tied to microbes and their role in these things in our, in our, in our, in our change in society. So here's my favorite topic, fecal transfers. Don't dial this number, but anyway. <laughs> So I, I want to sh show you that microbes can actually be used to cure diseases. So Clostridium difficile, which is an infection, you well know in Quebec, caused by antibiotics. Antibiotics don't fix it, but if you have a fecal transfer from a healthy person, you've got an over 90% cure rate to an otherwise very serious and potentially lethal disease, just by poop from a good person or a well person into a sick person. So we're starting to exploit these microbes for the benefits of these things too. So our group has really been engaging in some very interesting thought processes, and these are kind of the areas we're sort of focusing on now. First of all, what I call the bookends of life, early and late life. This is where the microbes change the most and seem to have the biggest effect. For example, if you're born by a C-section, you have a 25% higher rate of getting asthma and a 30% higher rate of becoming obese just by how you stick your head in this world. So I love to say, the best birthday present a mother can ever give her kid is that very first one, a big bowl of fecal and vaginal microbes. Yay. Gross as heck, but the kids need these things. This helps them develop. The other end of life, so healthy aging. We now know microbes play a major role in this. And for example, if you take the top 10 reasons why the average Canadian dies, number eight is bacterial or microbial, that's pneumonia and influenza. We now know that nine of those other ten reasons are actually microbes related to. I don't have reason and time to show you all this. I actually wrote a book with my daughter who's a gerontologist on how to age with your microbes if you're interested in this more. But they're finding amazing effects in there. Then we realize we live in a community, right? So you shake hands with people, you share houses, you share other things with these things. Turns out we have this community microbiome. This actually impacts you. 
If you have an obese friend, you have 57% higher chance of being obese. If you have IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, your spice, spouse has a much higher chance of getting that disease. It's not genetic, and we have a lot of interesting things now that maybe these are microbes. So, okay, it's us and our microbes. How do we figure out how we can look at this and what are we going to do for the future? So some of our members, including Heinrich Pointer here, studies ancient microbes. So this is um, a body from Troy. It's not Helen, but it's a woman that died of disease there. We were able to sequence the microbes, show what she died of. But more neater, he studies Roman latrines and Viking latrines, and um, this is 9,000-year-old poop. You think you eat a lot of fiber? Check that out. <laughs> we can sequence these microbes. Great, we know what they are, but you can then line them up to when plague comes through, for example. And you can see how the microbes change in these things. And are the microbes adapting quickly? So the tenet I want to really get at is these things can change really, really quickly. If you go on a diet, your microbes will change by tomorrow. So they're adaptively genetic. We can't change as a homo sapiens for a long time, many generations. So this gives you this real genetic flexibility. These microbes bequeath on us, and they're just part of us. And so there's all sorts of interesting possibilities of how these things can affect our survival. So I'll leave with you a thought that, well, here's a, here's a lovely thought. If you take a gram of feces, which is about the size of your little finger, a um, piece of poo, that contains over more microbes than the entire population of humans in this earth. So think of the genocide you commit every time you go to the washroom. <laughs> but besides that, we're, microbes are part of us, and I think this realization in the last decade that they're just part of us this is what they do. This is part of our life. Every multicellular organism has these microbes, and they influence the adaptability of these things to um, basically live in this world as it changes. So climate change, all these other changes, microbes are changing, and if we figure this out, hopefully that can help us to live with these microbes for our benefit. Thank you.